All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability Life number 189. And today I am going to do my best to keep up with this fast talker. Emma Dendler, when I watch your videos, I'm like, yes, another fast talker. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Love thanks so much fast. for joining. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. So I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel. You're also on Instagram. You're on Pinterest and even TikTok these yes, days. That's right? new. <laughs> yeah. Got to keep up with the trends. <laughs> you, you have to and use yeah. your young energy. That's where all the young energy is, right? Mm hmm. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your your journey or how you came to Japan? Sure. So I grew up in Ohio in the U.S. and then I joined the military. And then from there, I did a, a quick tour in Texas and then I moved to Japan. The military brought me here. Nice. And how did you get interested in eco living, eco hacks, uh, vegan lifestyle? I know you talk about this on your YouTube channel. Can you give us a short summary? Yeah. So it actually started when I moved out of my small town. I only lived in a town of about 2,000 people. So it's really hard to see like where our waste went and everything like that. So once I moved to Texas, I really got to see the issue with plastic and they didn't have recycling there. So I, that was when I took my first steps to set up a recycling program. And I was really focused on the physical waste, um, especially like reducing my own. And then when I moved to Okinawa, we are in the middle of the ocean, so we see a lot of plastic wash up on the shores here. And that's what really, truly inspired me to start educating others as well and help others make changes and not just me make changes. Yeah. I think for me as well, once I started doing beach cleanups, and I'm really mm -hmm. jealous, by the way, that you're in Okinawa because <laughs> I grew up in Hawaii and I really oh. miss being next to the beaches. I mean, we, nice. I'm in Hiroshima. We have beaches here, but they're not quite the same They're just cold as beaches. <laughs> or Hawaii, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when you see all the plastic waste on the beaches, it really, it's gut-wrenching and it's getting it worse and worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you talk about this a lot on your social media as well. And for me, um, I've seen that you've called out some big companies like Coca-Cola. Are you mm -hmm. happy with being the biggest polluter that I see, right? Yeah. And also when we do cleanups, I'm like 7-Eleven. I'm finding mm -hmm. so many of your bags, right? So kind of trying to keep companies accountable. But yeah. it's, it's like overwhelming. And you it must really see is. so much. Yeah. I think that's really interesting, especially being like in the middle of the ocean, we see a lot of trash from the rest of the world as well. So that's one of the things we do when we do beach cleanups is we look up the companies and see where does this trash actually come from. Have you um, done any like organized cleanups or you just kind of go out and do it whenever you're around the beach? Yeah, I typically go out on my own. I got a little bit involved with Okinawa Beach Cleanup in 2019, but then they had to stop a lot of the group beach cleanups last year. So I haven't been a part of like a huge organized beach cleanup yet. Yeah. Um, it's great that you share what you're doing when you go and do the beach cleanups. I think it, it helps raise awareness. Mm -hmm. And like for me as well, and I, I'm sure you've, you've had some things that have changed in your life about the way that you buy things because you Definitely. find them. You find yep. them on the beach. Yep. <laughs> so like I, I vowed to give up pet bottles once we mm -hmm. started beach cleaning because even though it is technically recyclable, so much of it ends up in the water and yeah, exactly. uh, so little of it is actually recycled in any usable sense. A lot of it's burnt. So yes. that was that was one of the changes I made just for myself. And I challenged myself, can I stop buying pet drink bottles? And and then it took about a year adjustment. I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you often challenge yourself. Um, have you done any challenges that it, what you thought it's going to be so difficult, but once you did it, it was like, it was okay. Um, I, don't, I can't think of anything that I've done, but actually one that I'm doing this coming week is trying to shop plastic free in Japan. And I going into it, I think it's going to be very difficult. We'll see how it goes. Um, definitely going to try to buy it from a lot of local farmers and see if they're willing to not package their stuff in plastic. So we'll see how that goes. 
I, I remember thinking, uh, giving up milk in my coffee when I mm. tried to become vegan. I really thought that was going to be a huge hurdle or yeah. milk in my tea because I, I just become so used to it. Yeah. And I remember a friend saying, oh, once you go black, you'll never go back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I really like it. I really like the lattes. But um, mm -hmm. for me, that, that was something that surprised me. That mm -hmm. it wasn't actually as hard as I had built it up in my mind. Yeah. Um, and then in the other way, sometimes there's things that I think is going to be easy and it's actually really hard. Mm -hmm. Have you had that same yeah. kind of Yeah. Um, actually, when I went vegan, I thought it was going to be easier because I didn't eat much meat and dairy anyway. But then once I started, I realized it's very difficult, especially when it comes to like restaurants to get togethers, take out, that sort of stuff. I think especially in Japan, um, yeah. being vegan is really hard. And I know it is that tricky. you and your husband do a lot of traveling as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear um, how you find traveling in Japan as someone who's trying to do z low waste or zero waste mm -hmm. as well as trying to look for vegan options. How have you found it? The combination is very tricky when traveling. Um, so we use the app called Happy Cow to find vegan restaurants, as well as learning phrases like no meat, please. Do you have vegan food? Um, and then zero waste is especially hard when traveling. So I try to bring my own things like my own reusable water bottle, coffee cup, utensils, bags to try to avoid any single use plastic. But of course, I might have to snag a quick onigiri or something. Um, just try to minimize my plastic when traveling. Maybe not completely zero waste. I'm showing on screen, you uh, introduced to your fans on YouTube a card that you carry around, which has uh, Japanese and English mm -hmm. that you show. I'm a vegan. I can't eat meat, poultry, or fish, including dashi eggs. Thank you for your understanding. Very polite. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Have you found this is quite effective? Yes, it does help explain my diet especially when I stumble with my words because I'm very slow when it comes to speaking Japanese. So having that handy is definitely helpful. And can you talk a little bit about why you chose to be vegan? Because you actually mm -hmm. became vegan in Japan, right? I did. Um, so this gen last January was just my two-year vegan anniversary. And I actually went vegan for the planet. I know most people go vegan for the animals. And that kind of came later on for me. But I had read about how detrimental factory farming and even milk and egg production can be for the planet. And I just didn't want to contribute to that anymore. So I just decided to quit eating animal products. Has there been anything that you've missed that you found really hard to, to swap out? Um, I don't think so. At first, I, okay, I guess cream cheese is one. <laughs> um, but at first, there wasn't very many vegan options here at our stores and for restaurants but over the last two years we've really gotten a lot of things curry tacos butter whipped cream we have just about anything you can imagine but vegan here now and it's really awesome to see that that's great i know uh having access to costco has been really useful mm -hmm. for me and i know a lot of people uh think it's just getting big meats at costco but mm -hmm. actually it's really great for vegans um, because there's so much uh, fruit and veg. There's yeah. like vegan butter, which is imported. There's also like larger containers of miso or things. So you oh, can wow. have a bit less waste. I yeah. know that on, on base, you probably have more uh, vegan options. Maybe like yeah. the meat substitutes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our on base store is kind of like a Walmart. Um, yeah, we do have the meat based or plant based meats and cheeses and things, and that is harder to find um, out in the town. Yeah. I heard you You even have vegan ice cream. That's one of the yes. things I miss. Yeah. That's pretty new, though. We have a few flavors of Ben & Jerry's, so that's exciting. That is exciting. Yeah. Um, there are a few vegan products you can get through Amazon in Japan, which, hmm. which I've seen, like ice creams and stuff. There's also a lot more cafes and food yeah. stores in Tokyo, which are now doing online delivery. So oh, in cool. that way, uh, coronavirus has been quite good um, because mm. they, they've moved business more online instead of just in person. 
So that's that's nice. Yeah, that is neat. One of the other main themes of your uh, videos, of course, is decluttering. In fact, yes. one of your most watched videos is all about your decluttering challenge. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about it? Yes, so for that challenge, I decided to challenge myself to declutter at least one item every day for about 40 to 42 days. I think it was six weeks. Um, and it started out with being very simple because I knew exactly what I wanted to declutter, but come around four or five weeks, it was really a struggle to find something to declutter. So I had to get creative sometimes, but I ended up getting rid of a lot of stuff in my house that just wasn't either serving me a purpose anymore or really bringing me any sort of joy. So it's really good. It's interesting that you say not bringing you joy. I know exactly mm -hmm. who you're talking about. Yep. Who says that. <laughs> <laughs> Marie Kondo, she has had yes. such a huge effect on she really has. Uh, people's mentality about keeping your clutter, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, on the other extreme, I find it really interesting that, that you are also a dumpster diver. Yes. <laughs> So there's no real dumpster diving like on base or in Japan really, but people will put their bulk trash out on Wednesday night, Thursday morning. And oftentimes it's really good things like furniture, cans of food that have been untouched. So we rescue that stuff. If it's something like furniture or clothing that doesn't have holes and it's not stained, we'll donate it to the local thrift stores. We'll keep the um, food for us. Uh, yeah, it's been very fun to experiment with that. That's wild. Yeah. And it's, it's so worth doing because you're, you're saving um, useful things that would otherwise end up in the landfill or mm -hmm. be burnt. Um, you're giving it a new life or extending mm -hmm. the life of the product. So, um, and you're saving money at the same Definitely. time. Definitely. Right? Yeah. yeah, we've actually furnished our house. Like, it, I'd say probably half from dumpster diving. Wow. I mean, we used to, in Japan, we used to have what's called Daigomi Day. And it, once a month or once every two months, we would have Daigomi Day, which means big garbage. Oh. And then everybody would put their big garbage out on the street. And then you would see people in recycle shop trucks going around picking stuff up. Uh, people who moved in recently would pick up stuff for themselves it was actually a lot of reuse was going on mm -hmm. um but then they they stopped it now you have to make a reservation if you have anything over a certain size you have to pay uh a little bit and it's picked up you have to schedule a day so it's a little bit more of a high hurdle or you have to yeah. take it to the dump directly um interesting some stores will let you pay them and they'll they'll take it like if you get a new uh, refrigerator you'll pay a little bit more they'll take the old one and and that's pay that's the recycle charge yeah. um, maybe different system for you guys on base yeah um, we have a recycling center on base and they just take a lot of the bulk items and so I think that's why a lot of people just put stuff out on the curb, whether it's good or bad. It's just because it's so easy to get rid of. Yeah. So that's that's good that you can get rid of things you don't need, but it's mm -hmm. bad that it kind of encourages overconsumption. Yeah, it does. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you did a, a big episode recently about overpopulation versus overconsumption. Can you yes. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that's... It kind of stemmed from my biodiversity series. I made a comment about overpopulation not being that big of an issue. And I had some de friendly debate in the comments. So it inspired me to do more research on it to see if overpopulation really is the issue or we're just consuming too much. And I still come to the conclusion of we're just consuming way too much stuff. Whether we have 7 billion people on the planet or 11 billion people, either way, we're consuming too much. That was one of the things, did you see the movie recently um, Michael Moore did, a documentary about um, the planet, and he was kind of critical of the environmental groups and their activities and how there is greenwashing. It is true, there is greenwashing. You do have to be aware of that. All things echo or green are not necessarily good. 
But one of the conclusions that he kind of focused on in the film was about uh, overpopulation and kind of blaming mm. people having too many children. And so I was glad to listen to your video because I, mm -hmm. I really agree with a lot of the points that you were making. Yeah. That it's so unfair for people who are living with so much to point at people who are actually making so little impact on our environmental woes and mm -hmm. saying that because they have more kids, they're causing more of the problem. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's I think it, you said in your video as well, it's like people don't want to change their yeah. lives too much. Change is hard. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Um, you went to Nara and Osaka yes. and uh, did some travels. Tell us mm -hmm. about when you travel, what are mm -hmm. some tips that you would give people to try to travel in Japan low waste? Okay. Um, so unfortunately, when we go to the mainland, we do have to fly. But once we get there, we opt for trains as much as possible. We're not allowed to use trains right now being part of the military with the coronavirus. So we opt for fuel efficient cars, even electro electric cars if possible. Um, so that's how we get around for low waste. And then of course, bringing my reusables, asking people to fill up my water bottle instead of buying plastic water bottles, asking to use my own coffee cup instead of their paper cup, things like that. And then even if we have the option to cook at home, try that or organic places, vegan places, um, and try to avoid convenience stores and fast food. Wow, yeah, and do you find it like really hard or have you kind of gotten used to it where it's not too much of a headache now? To be zero waste when we travel? Yeah. Um, I've gotten better at it, definitely, but it's still a challenge. Um, if we are in an area where there's not vegan food but there's a family mart, well, we have to get a little bit of plastic at Family Mart in order to have a meal. Um, so that's when it becomes difficult, I'd say. Have you found it's getting a little bit easier? I think you've been in Japan about two years, have you? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed a shift kind of in understanding in terms of veganism or in terms of low waste? Like when you ask for something without oh. wrapping, um, is it getting yeah. a little bit easier, you think? I think so, especially with the plastic bag charge um, last summer. I think, um, at least now when I go to convenience stores, they used to just instantly put something in a bag before I could say something. But now, unless I ask for a bag, they're not going to put it in a bag, which is really cool. Um, as well as the veganism thing, a lot of more places are, at the at least at the bare minimum, offering soy milk instead of regular milk, which is cool. And then even just omitting meat from dishes and then calling it vegan. That's so pretty cool to see too in a lot of places. Yeah, it's so nice when um, you ask, you say the same thing you ask at every restaurant and the staff just gets it. And you're like, yes, yes! I don't have yes. to go through all the, I'm not sure they understand what I'm saying or right. you know, is it really <laughs> gonna be vegan? Like they just get it. They're like, oh, vegan? Yes. Vegetarian? Yeah, sure. Right. You know? That's awesome. That makes such a big difference. I've actually it's had up. a bit of a train. I call it training or a conversation because you always try to keep it positive, right? Mm -hmm. um, like when you're, I, I've had a training or a positive conversation with uh, Costco over oh. the last year because we've been more strictly vegan in the family, we've vegetarian for mm -hmm. a long time. So I've been trying to get the pizza at the food court without oh. cheese or meat. And without meat has been easy for a long time. Yeah. And then a few staff, every time I order it, they're like, without cheese too? I don't think <laughs> we can do that. And I was like, I think you can. Can you right? ask? You know? <laughs> you just try to keep it positive and light, yeah. you know? And could yeah. you ask? Would you mind asking? Like, don't get angry. You know, mm -hmm. just keep softly politely happily yeah. pushing you know mm -hmm. oh you can't oh, okay i'll go away you know but um, yeah right <laughs> that seems to work pretty well in japan mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, so we talked about your decluttering. I love that. <laughs> would you give someone any tips? Like, how would you get started with decluttering? You mm -hmm. did your 45-day challenge, which must yeah. have been really hard. But how can someone just get started if they want to declutter? Would you give them mm -hmm. any advice? Definitely start small. That's what I had to do with that challenge. I had to pace myself because I knew it was going to take 45 days, as well as I didn't want to be overwhelmed. So don't think, I have to declutter my entire house. Think, I'm going to declutter this one drawer in my kitchen. Tomorrow, I'll declutter another drawer. And then eventually, you'll be able to move on to the bedroom and the living room without getting so overwhelmed all at once. So when you're talking about decluttering, you're talking about passing things on, like to thrift stores and stuff? Mm -hmm. Or... Yeah, I'd say like about 90% is still able to be thrifted. Sometimes I'll stumble across like some old bills or receipts that will just go in the trash or recycling, but most of the time it will be donated. And you just moved over two years ago, so I would mm -hmm. imagine there wouldn't be as much to declutter as someone who's lived in the same house yeah. for 15 <laughs> years. I think I've got a lot of decluttering to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, even over just the course of two years, I'm already looking at stuff that we're going to have to pack soon. And it's crazy how much we can accumulate over time just shoving in the back of cabinets and closets and just forget about it. So I try not to do that as well. I try to be intentional with what I bring into my home in the first place so I don't have to declutter so much every year or so. Yeah, I find that I've been much more strict about not buying things just for the sake of buying them, like on mm -hmm. holidays and stuff. And I see that you uh, sometimes also focus on the holidays. Yeah. Um, talking about Halloween or Christmas or Valentine's Day, which yes. is coming up. Can you give us some tips for Valentine's Day, how to do low waste? Yeah, I mean, same with any holiday. Don't just buy stuff because it's on sale or because it's Valentine's Day themed. Um, as well as try to find chocolates that might be wrapped in paper or fair trade or vegan. Those are all much better than something that's been mass produced in plastic. Um, other things too, like try to get local flowers instead of flowers that might be shipped from South America, especially being over here, that's a long way for flowers to travel. Um, and really anything like maybe don't get takeout because that might have a lot of plastic. Maybe cook a meal instead with your significant other. That's even you know, more fun. It can be more of a date too. Yeah. And I should mention now that uh, we have a workshop, Seeking Sustainability Live workshop on Valentine's this year. And we have a chef who's going to teach how to do vegan Japanese style cooking. So if you're interested in that, have a look on inboundambassador.com under the SSL workshops. And there's still signups available. So please sign up if you're interested. But yeah, cooking a nice meal at home instead of doing takeout, you have so much less waste. And it's mm -hmm. often, it's much more special too. Yeah. I think because now we can't eat in restaurants. So it is mm -hmm. a much, kind of a, you can make a, a more special atmosphere maybe. Yeah. And especially with I, being vegan, you don't have to worry about explaining your diet. You know exactly what you're going to make, exactly what you're going to eat. Yeah. I love your idea about bulk chocolate, though. Mm. That's a really good point. And fair trade. For yes. people that don't really know about why buy fair trade or why buy organic chocolate, can you give us a little rundown? Yeah. So we'll start with fair trade. Um, a lot of chocolate is produced with unethical labor. They might not be getting paid fairly. Um, and then same with the farmers who even grow the cocoa beans, they might not be getting paid fairly for their yield. So fair trade ensures that the chocolate was produced ethically, everyone was paid fairly, everyone was treated fairly. And then with organic, um, it's important with things that we eat or even wear because it means that there's less or zero herbicides, pesticides used on them, which of course could be a detriment to ourselves, but it can also leach into our groundwater, into our soil, and just there's a bunch of chemicals everywhere. So opting for organic is great too. And then cooking at home versus takeout, of course, you just have so much less plastic. Yeah. And so much less single use items, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, buy locally grown flowers. Or I think mm -hmm. in your video, you were talking about getting seeds. 
Oh, yeah. That was a gift I got a few Valentine's days ago. Um, That was a lot of fun because then I got to see, like, my my flowers grow themselves and got to put in a little bit of hard work. And it was a lot more exciting, I think, to see them grow over the next few months instead of enjoy some flowers for a few days. Yeah. Or buy plants. If you're at the florist, you want to give a special living bouquet of some kind. I always yeah. prefer if people buy me plants and then I can keep it for a long time. Yeah, definitely. One interesting thing about Japanese culture, though, um, I was in the hospital for a little while and uh, somebody uh, brought me flowers and I said, oh, it's too bad it's it's flowers because I was going to be there for a while. Mm. And then they said, it's really bad luck in Japan to give a plant in a hospital because it's like you're setting down roots. So it's kind of bad luck. Like we don't want you to be here forever or too long. So cut flowers, which will wither and die. Hopefully you'll be home by then. And I thought that was really interesting. It is. But I'm not superstitious, so I didn't mind. Yeah. Plants are (laughs) fine. Um, but the florist industry, that's a really big business in Japan and maybe most parts of America, too. Mm-hmm. And flowers are not only a lot of pesticides or fertilizers is used, but it's also flown around the world, right? Yeah. So buying buying local flowers, like local um, wild flowers and, yeah. and other things. It's a yeah. Good good option like it, we're about to be on lily season here in okinawa so that would be a great option for valentine's day or white day um, instead of getting roses from halfway across the world yeah nice also um for jewelry you say by mm-hmm. vintage or lab grown jewelry can yes. you tell us about that so the jewelry industry is another one that's very detrimental to the planet when it comes to mining gold silver diamonds all of the above. Um, it can be very harmful. You, um, whether it's mountaintop clearing or mining underneath, it can be harmful to the people and the surrounding environment. So by buying your jewelry vintage or secondhand, you're not um, contributing to that. And then something else too that I mentioned in the video is even if you don't like the piece, you can at least salvage that material, take it to a jeweler and have them create it into something you actually love. I love that. And when I was talking recently um, to people who uh, understand the kimono culture and kimono fashion Mm. very well, this is also true for kimono, that if your kimono is damaged, you can still salvage some of the material and take it to a kimono shop and remake it. Or there's a lot of artisans now who are reusing the kimono material, making it into handbags, um, making it into jewelry or different purpose, but the whole concept of kimono is to use it for generations. Use it as long mm-hmm. as you can. Keep repurposing it. And so, like jewelry, kimono can be something in Japan that you can mm-hmm. use for a very long time. I love That's that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love vintage jewelry. It, it yeah. seems to have a story, too. Right? Definitely. But yeah. I haven't heard of lab-grown jewelry. What do you mean by that? Hmm. So that's specifically with diamonds. Um, I don't really understand the process, but instead of going into the earth and blowing things up to harvest a diamond, they just, um, I think they will take like the composites that make a diamond and then just grow it in a lab for a lot less environmental damage. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of human toll as well, a lot of child labor that goes mm-hmm. into the mining process for diamonds, especially. Um, yeah. So something to think about before you buy something. And Definitely. if you do buy something or if you have something, of course, don't throw it away. Try to yeah. use it as long as you can. <laughs> for sure. And pass it on. Keep using it. Um, I like your your whole concept of talking about biodiversity, too. Mm-hmm. And you were inspired by... David Attenborough, is that right? Yes, yes. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Sure. So I watched his documentary, um, A Life on Our Planet, a few months ago. He's made documentaries for his entire life, and it really inspired me to learn more about biodiversity because he mentioned it briefly. And then I also noticed, too, um, moving from the north down here to Okinawa, 
just how much more plants and wildlife were here. And I wondered why. And it's because of biodiversity. And the closer you get to the equator, the more diverse the biodiversity is. Um, so it's a three-part series currently. I first touched on what even is biodiversity and what can we do to save it. Part two was talking about how we as humans are actually killing biodiversity with things like soy, meat, palm oil production, and deforestation. And then part three was some hopeful news about how we can actually save biodiversity. It's not too late. Um, what we have been doing to the planet, we can stop doing. Yeah. It's so important to just think about what options are out there and yeah. how we could make changes even a little bit and mm-hmm. just make things a little bit better. I love your motto. Uh, you want to focus on what is free, what is easy, and what is fun. Yes. <laughs> I love that, right? Because hey, I, I think yeah. the whole concept of sustainability, people just think is too hard. Yep. I don't want to do that. That's too much change. It's why nobody else is doing it. Why should I do it? Mm-hmm. So I think having that focus on what's practical, what's fun, what's easy yeah. to do, it's great. How'd you come up with that concept? I think it's because I also didn't want to make a bunch of changes and spend a lot of money to better the earth. So I was like, surely other people feel this way. So that kind of just became the premise of my channel to prove that you don't have to buy a bunch of swaps and you don't have to change your entire lifestyle to live even just a little bit more sustainably. Um, you have a series also about things that are kind of difficult to recycle, things yes. that you cannot recycle in your normal recycling bin. Can you explain those a little bit? Yes. Um, I was inspired by this actually by my mom. She would just kind of throw every bit of plastic into her recycling bin, and I would always have to tell her, like, no, mom, that's not recyclable. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that. You can't put things like your single-use plastic utensils and bags. Um, A lot of thin plastics can't be recycled, but people just put it in their recycling anyway. But the problem with that is that when it all gets mixed together, it makes it very hard to even recycle the recyclable plastics, and they might end up in the landfill. So I wanted to educate people about what you should and should not be putting in your bins so that that way the materials have the most likely chance of being recycled and we can prevent as much from the landfill as possible. Great. Um, there's some things which I think looks like what you can recycle. For example, yeah. is it called Tetra Packs? Yes. Um, so if you buy almond milk or soy mm-hmm. milk, for example, it's usually in a Tetra Pack. It's like foil lined or aluminum lined. And mm-hmm. then you can't actually put that in the uh, carton recycling at the supermarket, yes. which is it's mm-hmm. really annoying. And there's it only is. certain places that can take it. Yeah. So not ideal. Nope, definitely not. Um, I did a, a crazy trip to San Francisco. One of the key things I wanted to see was the Recology Recycling Center. And oh. I, I've done a video and podcast about that. It was amazingly interesting. And he was talking about, of course, the best container you can choose is a reusable one. Bring your own container, refill it. Um, That is absolutely the best. But if you have to choose something you're just going to use once, make sure it's a material which is in demand. So Mm. plastic has no value. Nobody's buying plastic. So don't buy plastic. Uh, Tin, aluminum, glass, paper, it's in demand. You can sell it. You can buy it. That's the material you should choose. And I thought that was a great way to explain it, the whole yeah, confusing it is. concept, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You um, have a thing about paper, Yeah. Uh, step-by-step recycling paper. Can you tell us yes. about that? Yes. So that video was after I had explored how paper is recycled, um, where where is it recycled, and all that sort of stuff. So I thought... Maybe I'll do my own experiment at home, see how easy it is to recycle paper, see how many times it can be recycled. And it was really cool to actually get to see the process for myself and appreciate paper recycling even more. Um, Yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah, 
I would love to try washi making, Japanese paper making. Oh, yeah. Um, because there's some places in Shimane, I think, near Hiroshima, where they use a special kind of weed. It's not, it's not grass. It's not a tree. They use a kind mm. of weed, and they break that down to make paper. And wow. I would love to explore that more because if we can be so use cool. weeds to make paper, I know it's small yeah. scale, but that's a lot of potential for the future, right? Definitely, because people just cut it down anyway. Yeah. Now, you've done a few really fun DIY projects. You also yes. made a cat tower. <laughs> yes. I was inspired by that. that. Um, yes. So there's this challenge that's on Instagram. It's called Futuristic February. And what that is is a trash audit. A trash audit is when you keep all of your trash for a month. At the end of the month, you look at it and see, what can I reduce? What can I omit completely? And we buy a lot of our food in cans, beans, peas, corn. And that was like the big bulk of our trash for our trash audit. So I'm like, I want to upcycle these cans in some way. I don't want them all to go to recycling. Recycling is good, but we should try to avoid it if possible. So I had just gotten a cat as well. We thought we should build her a cat tree and almost all the materials were upcycled, the cans, the wood, the fabric, and it was so much fun to make. It was like our first big construction project in her house. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I'm yeah. showing the picture right now okay. and your cat is too cute. Yes. She looks like she enjoys that. So you, you use cans and then you, did you wrap it in string or something? Yes, they're wrapped in like a twine type material, so it makes for a good scratching post as well. Nice. Yeah, I'm, it's driving me crazy. We have uh, some, we have four rescue kittens, mm. and uh, they were born on our porch, and then the next oh, wow. two were born on our porch next year. So we've got four, and they're all great. They're super sweet, but yeah, we need some more scratching posts, I think, because our sofas are starting to yeah. look a little frayed. <laughs> Oh, no. And you also have a dog, right? Yes. Two critters. How do the cat and dog get along? They get along really good now. She was very timid of him at first because he's not really that small. So, But they're, they're friends now. That's nice. Yeah. Um, I, I never even imagined like having a cat and dog in the same house. But uh, yeah. it's nice, that, nice when it works out. Definitely. Now you've you've tried so many different things. You also love cooking. Um, yes. But you did talk about sometimes you have a, like a failed echo hack where it just yeah. doesn't quite work. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yes. Um, I failed at a couple of things. The first one I can think of is I tried to make my own dryer balls so I didn't have to buy dryer sheets anymore. All of the yarn fell apart in my washing machine. So I had like yarn spaghetti mess in my washing machine. So that was very unfortunate. And then the second one I tried, I tried to preserve my own chickpeas. The first time it went really well, but the second time my jars didn't seal. So they ended up fermenting, which is fine. It's still edible. I just had to be creative with how I used it. So I didn't make any food waste. That, I mean, it, it happens, but yeah. I'm so glad when to see people like you who you have so much great advice. It looks like you're doing everything perfectly. You're an inspiration to so mm -hmm. many people. But I think it's really important to also be honest when things Definitely. don't go right. Because otherwise people watching, they'll have things go wrong and they'll be like, oh, I, I'm just useless and they'll give up, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But I think following your honesty or your transparency or your failure stories is actually inspiring mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah, I think so too. And that's why I try to show both like the tips as well as it's okay to fail. Um, just try to think around, think outside the box and try to save your fail. Yeah. And then it's not that's a fail great. after all. No. And it's, it's really important. I think in social media, uh, in terms of marketing in this new age of mm -hmm. honesty, that it, it is important to be honest and not Definitely. to be perfect. Um, like you, you sometimes talk about the zero wasters with the little mason jar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how that's, a, that's kind of an impossible goal for most people, right? Yeah. 
yeah, that's why I focus on free, easy, and fun ways is because a lot of people see like the biggest zero wasters out there only keeping five years worth of trash in a mason jar. And that can be really discouraging. They're like, how am I going to get there? I can't do that right now. So I try to show the reality that it's okay if you still use trash bags and produce a lot of trash throughout the year as long as you're reducing it slowly. Absolutely. You just keep looking for options that you might be able to try and change mm -hmm. and reduce in some way. And then if it works and you can change and make reductions, that's the way forward, right? Yeah. I, I sometimes meet people who tried from a meat diet to veganuary and all of a sudden like tried it for a month and it was horrible. And they, yeah. they might have continued maybe one or two recipes, but it was too big of a change at once. Mm -hmm. um, so I think doing things slowly, trying things here mm -hmm. and there, seems to have more success in the long term, yeah, would you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I kind of like to think about that like with exercising. Like I wouldn't go out and run a marathon right now. I'd start with a mile. Uh, you also talk about energy consumption and have yes. ways to conserve energy. Can you give us some of your tips? Yes. So I think energy consumption is one of the easiest and freest ways we can live low waste and it will even save you money. I think that's a really big encourager for a lot of people is letting them know that you can actually save money by living low waste. So something as simple as shutting off the lights when you leave a room and even unplugging devices that aren't in use, so easy but can save a lot of energy. Um, even going as far as using the residual heat on your stove and your oven, um, driving your car less, um, using like air drying instead of using your drying machine, a lot of things like that. You just got to think about your daily energy consumption and see how you can reduce it. Yeah, great. And so important to think about where your energy comes from. Yeah. Um, I think now in Japan, like I just switched my, we have solar on the roof, which I'm so happy oh, awesome. about, but it's not 100% of our energy needs. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy now that it's possible to change where your energy comes from. So now yeah. we have 100% renewable resource for our energy, of course. Technically, it's not solar energy that's coming down the grid, but they have to buy it from the renewable. So it, it all mm -hmm. helps um, the system. So I'm really glad that that's available now. So sometimes regulation, as well as technology, as well as consumer trends and consumer habits, it's all necessary for yes. the long-term view, right? Mm -hmm. Have you been able to make any changes uh, on a military base? Is that possible? Um, it's very difficult because we don't get a say in where our water or our energy comes from. So that's why I try to focus on like the more daily tasks and things within my life that I can control easily. Yeah. Well, you, you have some great advice whether you can control where the energy comes from or not. For example, about your computer energy. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, so our computers use a lot of energy if we keep them on running 24-7. So what I do is I put my computer on sleep mode and it uses significantly less power when you do that. And then even with like laptop computers, letting it charge to 100% and then unplugging it because if you leave it plugged in while it's at 100%, it could actually degrade the battery, meaning your computer won't last as long. Yeah, that's a good tip. And you were actually talking in one of your videos about uh, decluttering your desktop can also oh, help. Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes you might notice your computer's running a bit slow. Don't think about throwing your computer out. Look at like your files, your photos, things running in the background, because that could just be slowing your computer and it might not actually be like a hardware issue. Yeah, great. Um, you also had some tips about freezing and canning food. Can yeah. you tell us about that? Yeah. So if you um, have food that's about to go bad, don't throw it away. You can actually just freeze it. Um, sometimes with broccoli, I don't eat it right away, and then it starts to get a little weird on the top. I'll just cut the bad parts off, chop it up, and then throw it in the freezer until I want to use that broccoli. Same with bananas that have gone a little bit too brown. I'll save them and make my own vegan ice cream at home. 
a lot of things like that. And even canning food, I, I had planned to can some pumpkin, but then realized that you shouldn't do that. So I froze it instead. But then I also canned a bunch of chickpeas that worked really well the first time. Um, so just preserving food and giving it more life instead of just instantly thinking it's bad, going to put it in the trash can. I remember at Recology, he was also talking about what he does in his personal life mm. and use of coffee grounds. And oh. uh, he turned me on to using a French press or a coffee mm -hmm. plunger. And uh, if you do that, you don't have to use a filter. You have mm -hmm. just the coffee grounds and the hot water. And he's talking about the coffee grounds come from a very rich soil across the world. So definitely put it in your garden, put it in your house plants, you know. Yeah. And um, so I've, I've been doing that for a long time. It's nice little tips, right? Yeah, definitely. You also talk about natural dyes. What natural dyes have you tried? Oh, okay, so I got some white socks and a pack of socks that I had ordered, and I wasn't really a fan of the white, so I thought I would experiment with dyeing them with food scraps, so like the ends of purple cabbage turned my socks purple and it looked really beautiful. I also tried charcoal powder and it kind of gave my socks a grayish black look depending on how much I added. And you can dye things with so many different foods like the tops of carrots, the ends of onions, um, pumpkin peels. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about dyeing your own clothes. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to try that more. That is something that we talked about a little bit with an organic farmer in mm -hmm. the series. And he and his wife also run a textile uh, dye workshop. So maybe oh, wow. we'll do a workshop with them for natural dyes. That would be cool. They were talking about uh, local fruits that you can use, like persimmon, which has oh. a really nice like brown color. So yeah, I'd love to explore that more. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, let's talk about wasteful Japan, since we're yeah. in Japan, yeah? <laughs> um, what are some of your pet peeves that happens in Japan a little bit too often? The biggest one is just plastic everywhere, even at the farmer's markets where it's just coming from down the road, still potatoes and onions wrapped in plastic. Um, another one is the single-use oshibori, the wet towels. Some restaurants still do the reusable towels, but a lot of times it's the single-use wrapped in plastic ones. And sometimes they give me way too many if I order takeout. They'll throw like six or so in the bag, but it's just me and my husband eating them. So I see those everywhere. Um, thankfully, it's not really a thing anymore, but it used to just be excessive bagging as well. Um, I would get one thing at the convenience store and they'd put it in a bag anyway. So thankfully, yeah, you, that's not a thing. Yeah, you have to still be vigilant. It, it is a lot better than it used to be. Um, I think the plastic bag uh, charge has certainly helped. Um, but yeah, you'll find like a, a zero waste shopping area of vegetables or fruit and you're really happy because the tomatoes are not wrapped and then you'll yeah. get it to the counter. And even though you're not buying a bag, they still put it in one and you're like, wait yep. a second, no. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one time I used my own produce bag to get some broccoli and then the cashier put my produce bag inside a plastic produce bag. It just absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it boils down to the concept. And I know you've talked about this on your videos, too. The whole concept that plastic is clean. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And we need to change that mindset because anybody who does a beach cleanup, anybody who understands microplastics, knows that plastic is not clean. Plastic mm -hmm. is horrible and it's actually yeah. getting inside our bodies and we need exactly. to use it less, right? Yeah. Like, I guess I can see the argument that it's clean for the short term, you know, when you're and everyone's touching things at the farmer's market, but that's about it. Yeah. Now, on the good side of things in Japan, let's talk about fudoshiki. I know you're a fan mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Can you introduce? Yeah? Yes. So that's something that always gets brought up around Christmas all throughout the Zero Waste community, and it's really cool now that I get to live in Japan and see how it's done. Um, 
I think it's really cool that you can use it for gifts or you can even use it to take like your lunch or a snack in, um, your personal belongings. It's really cool how diverse you can use Furoshiki. Yeah. And do you know a very zero waste focused international company which is using Furoshiki instead of bags? No. Four letters? L U S H Oh Lush. They Lush. are. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I first did not know noticed that. it. Yeah, I first noticed it in the UK. And huh. they call it not wraps or package wrapping or something wrap. And I was like, that's Furoshiki. Oh my gosh. Wow. And then now whenever I do tourism consulting, I'm always saying, listen. An international company is using your natural, you know, your traditional heritage yeah. Japanese furoshiki idea. Let's bring it back to Japan. Let's use it everywhere. This is wonderful. And it's high quality. It's pretty. It's yeah. like added value because when they take the gift that you buy and they wrap it in front of you, it's kind of like a show. You know, so I'm I'm a huge fan of furoshiki. I want to see it everywhere. Yes, me too. That would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, less than 10 minutes left. Um, what are some 2021 targets that you have? I know you did a video about this. Can you take us through some of them? Yes, those are just general tips that I think just about anybody can implement this year. Um, it's simple things like carpooling, being mindful about your energy and water consumption. Um, I am completely blanking on what I wrote in that post, <laughs> but pretty much just setting intentional eco goals. Like don't strive to be 100% zero waste because you're going to beat yourself up because you're not going to meet that goal. Um, you know, and don't strive to be perfectly vegan. If you're still an omnivore, think about short term, easy goals at first, and then start building up to long term goals. And I think supporting others is also yeah. a great part of the process. Mm -hmm. Like, I really appreciate when people say, ah, oh, good job, or that looks great, or well done, you know? And of course, everybody <laughs> does. So yeah. if you see somebody making an effort, you know, like what they're doing, or comment on it, or share it. And it just, it gives you such a great feeling. Of, it really does. I'm, okay, I'm not gonna give up then. <laughs> so important. Um, also, I, I love your Pinterest. You've got so many great photos and your your short targets. I've been showing a lot of them today. Um, oh, yeah. That you make about your targets. And then if people want to see more, they can go and see your video. Mm -hmm. um, you and your husband are also photographers, right? Yes, yes. And you have a sustainable travel video uh, YouTube yeah. channel as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't post on there very much, but we um, on there we advocate for things like exploring your local area, um, doing like activities instead of just traveling to go shopping, um, and things like that. Nice. I think it's definitely easier when you and your partner or you and your family yeah. are kind of all on the same page in terms of uh, trying to have low waste goals or even <laughs> vegan vegetarian. It's, it's hard if everybody's kind of on a different agenda, right? Yeah. Yeah, I actually went vegan before my husband and it was very difficult for, yeah, for me to be vegan alone. But once he kind of um, got on board with it, we at least, he at least was vegan at home, which made it easier to cook and prep food. So definitely easier together. Do you have any other goals this year? You said you were looking into maybe a high, another degree or study? Yes. I would love to get my master's in sustainability. Um, if anything, I'd like to at least get the application in this year and then maybe start next year. Um, and then we're actually going to be moving probably back to the U.S. in June or July-ish. Um, once we get our own house on our own land, not on a military base, I would love to start a garden. That's my really big zero waste goal. Nice. Um, I think growing even a little bit of your own yeah. food 
is such a great goal, right? It is. It's such a great feeling. Yeah. And it tastes great too. Yes. <laughs> I'm I'm a horrible gardener, but luckily I have some connection to good organic farmers who are nearby who can supply us with local vegetables. <laughs> I, I wish yeah, I was I've, better. It's one of me my too. fails. Yeah. I have failed at growing several things. I've, I've been really successful at growing like windowsill, basil, and green onions, but every time I try to grow tomatoes, it, it never works. <laughs> yeah. So maybe once I get a bigger plot of land, because right now I'm just working out of like tiny pots, so maybe an actual plot of land will help. Maybe different climate will help. We'll see. <laughs> I hope so. I, I am always optimistic about that, right? Like if yeah. I just had the right space of land, I'm sure I could grow something. <laughs> but <laughs> hopefully that's true for you. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, you were talking about things that you stopped buying completely mm. or you completely uh, low waste swapped out. Can you tell yeah. us some of your most successful yeah, so it was either intentionally, like I intentionally quit buying these things for zero waste, or some of it was unintentional. Um, one of my absolute favorite swaps is my silicone baking mats, and that helps me replace tin foil, um, parchment paper, and even like the single use spray oils. You don't have to use anything except for the baking mat, so that's really cool. Um, my other favorite swaps, I don't buy dryer sheets anymore, I use wool dryer balls. I've been using the same two wool dryer balls for two years. They last a long, long time. And then even then, wool can be composted at the end of its life. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah. Um, there, might, there might be some vegans who don't buy wool because, yeah. you know, they're, they're more strict. Like, uh, they won't buy honey because mm -hmm. of bees. Um, but I, I'm maybe more similar to you, and I'm more thinking about the sustainability of things. Like, mm -hmm. I'm much more likely to buy vintage, even if it's an animal product, if I can reuse it, than yeah. to buy a new thing, which maybe is plastic. So exactly. it's, it's always kind of case by case. It's not, for me, it's not really black or white. You have to kind of think of every issue in mm -hmm. a case by case way. Are you kind of I feel way? the same, yeah. All right, well, we just have two more minutes. Is there anything we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to talk about? I don't think so. I think we definitely hit all the big points. Yeah, we've talked about a lot. Um, yeah. The, the e-waste thing, I think, is a big issue oh, that a lot of people yeah. don't know about. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. So a lot of the e-waste in the world um, gets shipped overseas to be recycled in facilities that aren't regulated, that people don't have personal protective equipment. Um, and then even, even in facilities where people do have the proper PPE, a lot of the times the chemicals from our e-waste actually leaches into water and soil and can be a detriment to the people living in the area and then the environment as well. So finding facilities that are recycling your tech properly, trying to get your tech refurbished instead um, trying to get just components complete, replaced, like if your if your laptop battery died, try to replace the battery versus buying a whole new laptop. Um, and then also buying tech secondhand is really great too. Yeah, and checking with the companies is also great. Yeah. Like um, there's some companies that will take it back after mm -hmm. end of life or will repair it for you. I know that Apple um, has a decent recycle policy um, also, the city offices, the ward offices in Japan, they often have a bin and they will collect e-waste. Wow. Um, that was one of the ideas for the Olympics, believe it or not, oh, was they yes. were collecting old telephones and old small e-waste devices, and they were using the metals to make metals for the Olympics. I'm not sure what's going to happen with all of that, but oh, um, yeah. they're still collecting the Remelt them e and put 2021 yes. on them. <laughs> I mean, these these are rare, rare, hard to find uh, minerals. So yeah. hopefully they will be collecting and reusing or at least repurposing in yeah. some way. Yeah. If you had one thing 
that you would recommend people try to do to live a more sustainable lifestyle? What, what would one thing you'd like people to try? My number one tip for all beginners is to swap the big four, which are the um, four most commonly used single use items, water bottles, coffee cups, utensils, and bags. I also throw to-go containers in there because those are easy swaps as well. I always have them in my book bag, whether I'm traveling or just going out for the evening. So that way I can reduce any single use plastic consumption for the day or for the trip. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. It's been awesome. So if you want to see more of Emma's wonderful, wonderful tips, um, have a look at her blog and we will put all the links below her blog, her YouTube channel, her TikTok and her Instagram and Pinterest as well. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining. It's been really fun learning from you and watching your videos. You inspire me. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow at 1030 in the morning, we're talking with journalist Melinda Joe. So please join us again tomorrow. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a great day. Bye.